I watch this story about a woman whose life is falling apart. She finds herself on the street, living out of a trolley, inside a tent. It was not always like this. You see, some years ago, she was a professor. She taught children. And after one of her evening classes on her way home, something tragically happened. She hit someone with her car. At first she thought it's probably a buck or some kind of wild animal. Because she for a moment, not drunk, but tired, fell asleep behind the wheel. Next morning, she, she saw there's not any visible damage to her car. But when she got the newspaper, she turned cold. A young lady was hit by a car that evening. Around about the time that she returned home. She's in critical condition in the hospital. And when she continued to read the article, she realized that this could have been her. Because this accident happened not only at the time she was returning home, but on the road on which she returned home to. And she thought about turning herself in. But she had a life and a career. There was no evidence of anyone hitting this girl. A tragic hit and run accident. But as she followed this young lady's path, she came to know that she was paralyzed from the waist down. And her what is the consciousness, conscience, conscience. Her conscience began eating at her. She started drinking. She lost her job. She lost her home. She found herself on the street. Ten years later, a police officer accidentally bump into her as she becomes a target of um, people um, terrorizing the homeless. The police come to her defense, but in coming to her defense, one young officer realizes that something's off. The way she looks and the way she's act, it, it's, it's not like other homeless people. And she starts digging into history and she, she can't put the two together of why would a woman that's, that's teaching as a professor at a university be homeless 10 years later? And it's only upon her return that she found a photo of this student that was hit. And in confronting the homeless woman, she burst out in tears, confessed that it was her, but also confessed that she's actually been longing for this day to be exposed, to, to let the truth be revealed, because it feels as if a weight has been lifted from her shoulders. This is a, a moment of a serious, my wife and I are, I'm watching from the rookie. But the reality of it is, sin has the ability to consume us. And this morning we're looking at gospel honesty. Um, last week we looked at gospel truth. And we find pages in the Bible where, where truth is revealed and we are encouraged 
to take hold of that truth. Not only to believe it, but to live it. And I would like you to turn with me to uh, 1 John 1. This is, the, this is not the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is John's account of Jesus' life on earth. This is a letter that John wrote to the early church, 1 John 1. And he starts off in much the same way. Few reminded us of, uh, of John, the Gospel of John, starting with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 1 John 1 starts like this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we looked upon, have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we've seen it. And we testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which we have seen and heard and we proclaim also to you. So that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Friend, John is, is on a roll here speaking about Jesus. Introducing Jesus as Jesus has introduced Himself before. Saying, I am the light of the world. But, more than introducing Jesus and telling them what He is proclaiming to them, John is reminding us that Jesus is real. As real as the guy or girl next to you. And He has seen Him. He has heard Him. He has touched Him. And it seems like for a couple of verses, John just can't stop telling them, that Jesus is real. In the gospel according to John, John would call himself the one that Jesus loved. And John is very convinced that he needs to, to assure this people, this follower, followers of Jesus, that Jesus is not like any other religion. You see, every other religion is built on visions and dreams of a person that might have uh, isolated him or herself. Dreamed up visions, compiled some folklore, and presented it for people to believe as truth. John is making very sure that this is not the case with Jesus. Jesus is not someone that was dreamt up. Jesus is not someone that was seen in a vision or a dream. Jesus is real. He is physical. He was with us. He rose from the dead. He is alive. And he does that by saying, we've seen him. Not only we've seen Him, we've studied Him. We've, we've investigated Him. In Afrikaans, it says, we, ons het andachtig gekyk. we intently looked at Him. We listened to what He said. 
we touch them. Not only did they touch Jesus as He handed out bread, as He multiplied fish and bread to to give food to, to thousands of people, Jesus, the risen Christ, comes to the disciples and He heard Thomas' words, I will believe it not only when I see it, when I can touch Him, when I can see and feel the wounds in His hand or in His side, then I believe that Christ is risen. And Jesus comes and meets him at his point of expectation. Jesus comes and says, Thomas, come. Here I am. This is me. I'm flesh and blood. I'm risen. And John makes very sure that this year is, year is this. That Jesus is someone to be experienced, to be heard, to be seen, to be studied, to be touched. And friends, none of us can say it in this way. Because when Jesus ascended into heaven, that privilege remained with the first early church. But we can experience Him. And much like John, when we experience Jesus Christ, it is impossible to deny Him. You can put a gun to my head. You can walk into this building saying, listen, unless you deny Jesus Christ, You will not see another day. I cannot deny Jesus. Neither can John. But John goes further than that. And John says, listen, this is this Jesus that we proclaim to you. This Jesus, the light of the world. But this Jesus, the salvation for all mankind. John goes to the point of saying, listen, we we proclaim this Jesus to you as the risen Christ, the light of the world. What message did they proclaim? They proclaimed the gospel. That Jesus Christ, God Himself, what they're learning up there, God Himself came to this earth. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He was fully God, yet fully man. And in being fully man, he did not choose to use any of his God-given attributes. He did not play those cards. He could have. The devil tempted him to do him. Even the guy crucified next to him said, Come on! If you're the Son of God, get yourself off that cross and us too. But he died. In my place and in your place for our sin, He died the death that we deserve. You see, death could not hold Him. God was fully satisfied in this perfect sacrifice. And He rose from the dead and He told His disciples, as He ascended into heaven, that He's coming back. And as believers in Christ, we are looking forward to that day. Jesus Christ is not just a story. Jesus Christ is not a myth. Jesus Christ is more than a legend. He is the light of God, the Son of God, the salvation for all mankind. And John can't stop himself from sharing this. But then John comes and reminds them that it's 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 not only that this message is proclaimed, it's when this message is proclaimed, people change. There's a oneness. Did you see that? Did you pick it up? We have fellowship with Him. When we walk in light, we have fellowship not only with Him, but also with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. We have fellowship with Jesus. There's a oneness. But then He warns. Then He warns us and says, listen guys. If we walk 
in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness, all sin. He's, there's a call to live in this light of Jesus Christ. It is more than a call to just be a good person. And that is what John is, one of the things that he's warning us about. One of the things he's warning us about is the fact that we can look like Christians, but not be Christians. There's a saying, you know, if it looks like a dog, and it smells like a dog, and it walks like a dog, and it barks like a dog, what is it? Is it? It's a dog. But you see... Mankind has the ability to look like a Christian, to walk like a Christian, to talk like a Christian, and have no relationship. John is not calling us to religion. John is calling us to relationship. He's telling us, listen, Jesus is not just someone to follow. It's someone to meet. It's someone to experience. And when you meet Him and when you experience Him, you will start looking different. And you'll start acting different. You may turn from a bad person to a good person, or from a good person to a Christ follower, still doing good, but not in order to win God's favor, because you have God's favor. We now live out of love. So there's two dangers. You can either be brought up in religion and lose relationship. Or not, not lose relationship. You can't lose a relationship. You're brought up in religion, but you don't know Jesus Christ, the light of the world. The other warning is you can be such a good person. And to the world you look good, and at your funeral, they may say he was such a good guy. He did so much for the poor. But will they say he loved Jesus? He knew Jesus. It's about relationship, not religion. And then he comes and says, listen, but you're, you'll be different. Jesus is light and in Him there is no darkness. And if, if you walk in this light, then you can't keep on lying. When you come to Christ, your life will change. But He's not calling for perfection. He's not a God that says, listen, when you come to Jesus, your life will be perfect. There won't be any more sin. No. He's very sober in this. And he calls out, listen, there is sin. He doesn't sugarcoat it. In this world, we sugarcoat sin. Sin is a taboo word. That uh, rainbow strap on that guitar... What is the first thought that comes to your mind when you see this? Because of media. This symbol has been used as a signifying thing for LGBTQ+. And it's so sad, and in a way... It is very, very scary. 
for a group of people to, to claim or to take hold of a symbol that is not only a reminder of God's promise, but also a reminder of God's judgment. When God gave, sent the flood, He saved Noah and his family and He gave him this sign to remember and to know that the Lord God will never in this way again wipe out sin from this earth. And now it has been hijacked by a group that is, that is longing, and, and Aldrich reminded us of that this morning, that is longing to have things that the Word of God say be, be null and voided. To call sin a choice. To call sin my freedom. To call sin my right. Worse, call sin a mistake. John does not do it. John says, listen, sin. There is sin, and sin needs to be dealt with. And sin although it might be in this life and in this world, it will not always be that way. There will come a day when sin and death is given the final blow once and for all. But John is not the only guy that is hard on sin when he calls us to say, listen, if we, have, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. James go on on the same on the same, um, in the same way, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. This follow a couple of verses from verse 14. This is James 5 verse 16 verse 14. He says, if anyone is sick among you, let him call on the elders. Let they pray over him and he will be healed and his sins will be forgiven. Then he starts with, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Paul, meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus, he sings the same tune. No, I'm not talking about Paul. <laughs> I'm talking about he does sing the same tune. I'm talking about the writer to Hebrews, which I'm convinced that it's Paul, but, but it's it's not. So just let's just stick to the writer of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews tells us, let us then um, lay off sin that entangles us so easily. The Bible is serious about sin. Jesus is. Matthew 5.23, Jesus says, listen, if you come to the altar, if you bring an offering or a sacrifice to God, and you have something against your brother, go back. Ask for forgiveness, make right, and then come and bring an, an offering. So we are clear, the Bible is clear that, that there is sin in this world. I believe we are not deceived thinking that, that there is not and we have not. If there is anyone among us that thinks he is without sin, then you only need to pray for one thing. Pride. Okay, that's a sin of pride, thinking that you've got it all sorted out. The rest of you, you know there is things in your life that does not align to the Word of God, that is not good for your, for your husband or wife or for colleagues. There's sin. But how do we handle it? How do we go about this confession? Now there's been churches that has built a little box and you can go there and you confess your sins. And the idea is right and it's biblical. 
to confess your sins. But the way they do it, I don't think it's helpful. Because I think that elevates the, the person listening to a level that we cannot attain. But the truth remains that there's a place of confession. And I'm going to speak out of my own personal experience. I'm fortunate to be part of a, a group of men of this local church that's the elders, and these guys have got my back. And I can go to them and say, listen guys, I'm struggling with this. Will you help me? Will you keep me accountable? Will you pray with me? So I've got trusted people in my life that I can go to. It is not the place to come to the front. And as we say, listen, if you've got any testimonies, please come and share it with us. That's not a testimony. It might become a testimony. If you go to people we trust, say, listen, there's something wrong in my life. I've got sin. I've prayed to God. That's the first person we go to. We go to God. We go to trusted people. For many of you that is in a marriage, it will probably be your spouse. That is someone that you can go to and say, listen, I'm really struggling with this. Sometimes we can just go and say, listen, I'm struggling with this and my wife can pray with me. Sometimes I need to go to her and say, listen, forgive me because I've sinned against you. So we either... We have to confess to God. And then we can confess to someone we trust or we can confess to someone we have sinned against. And that's a little bit tougher, but it's so good. And like this woman I told you about as we, as we started, as she confessed, a weight was lifted off her shoulders. The sad thing in this story is I don't know if she ever came to God. I do hope she did. I do hope she came to God and said, Lord, I've messed up. I've sinned. Please forgive me. And do you see that insurance that, that John comes and gives us? He says, when you confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No one else can do that. I'm just reminded about those uh, guys, um, what, did, what do they call it? Open doors. Open doors. There was a guy here, Arnold, and he taught us about this or, or shared with us about this guy that was, a, that was in a, a country where there was a terrorist group and he was part of that terrorist group. And the last person that he assassinated broke him. Not physically, but he, he, began, he couldn't sleep anymore. He, he continuously saw blood on his hands and he washed it, but he, he just felt that he always had blood on his hands. And he started speaking to, to friends. He reached out. He was going crazy. And one guy, a believer, told him there's only one guy. There's only one person. That can get that blood off your hands. And that is Jesus Christ. And he was intrigued. And he wondered. And he started investigating. And he went to God. He confessed his sins. And he said, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. And Jesus came and not only saved his soul, but he experienced a cleansing 
from all unrighteousness. Not approval for any of the evil he did, but a forgiveness of sins. And only Jesus is able to do that. 